The pain inside is devouring you, robbing you of joy and crippling your capacity to love. I can't. You're not stuck because you can't. You're stuck because you won't. That's from the movie The Shack, which if you've seen it or read the book, you know it does a pretty good job of exploring this impossible interplay that we're all in between consensus reality and the impossible to understand extended reality that seems to pop up now and then. It's a topic that I explored with the extraordinary astral traveler Jürgen Ziva. Here are a couple of clips. I was at that time a painting taught by a Vienna surrealist and so that went on really well. But then one night I, I had extreme experience, like a poltergeist thing. I had this picture of a demon on my easel and it fell off. And not only that, but an ashtray, which was next to it, was catapulted across the room. And at that time, I just didn't believe in anything supernatural and anything like that. It was totally out of my realm. I stood at the shore of an ocean and the waves crashing in towards me were made out of light. And each light, each wave that came to me was a, was a revelation, was offering a higher state of consciousness. And when I thought, oh, and, and all the time this was happening, I was in a state of total ecstasy. And every time a new wave came crashing in on me, there was another revelation, not just a revelation, but an even higher state of consciousness. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. As you know, this show is primarily about consciousness and what I like to call extended consciousness. That is all that strange, but impossible to deny stuff that seems to be happening beyond space and time in these metaphysical realms. And I'm really keen on people who are kind of undaunted in their effort to enter into those realms and try and bring them back and bring them down to a level of, if not science, at least a pre-scientific, deeper understanding of them. And that's one thing that I've always thought is so super impressive about the work of today's guest, Jürgen Ziva. And Jürgen was on the show a couple of years ago, and then I've begun this kind of intensive investigation into evil, not for evil's sake, but maybe as this lens to maybe giving us a different understanding of these extended consciousness realms. And there I am on the skeptical forum and I'm kind of babbling on and people are like, you have to talk to Jürgen, go back to Jürgen. He has the most extensive and well-documented exploration through his out-of-body experiences, into these realms and has really tried to catalog them. And I was like, hit up myself on the head. I'm like, of course, this guy really has the good. So a couple more things about Jürgen that you're gonna wanna know. He has some amazing books out, Multidimensional Man, Vistas of Infinity, The 10 Minute Moment. Please go and check those out, they are amazing. He also has an incredible website, Multidimensional Man, where he features all sorts of interviews that he's done in the past and other amazing stuff. And then as I was talking to Jürgen before this interview, and I was, he kind of saw some of the questions in the places I was going, he alerted me to the fact that he has this really great, and I hate to just kind of be pumping all this stuff up, but it's fantastic. I haven't, I haven't even had a chance to watch all of these because it's been a super busy week for me, but I'm going to watch every single one of them in this multi-part series of Afterlife Answers. And again, it's Jürgen sharing what he's learned from these extended realms. So this is a real treat. This is truly one of the pioneers and one of the most 
I think, important explorers, I want to say researchers, because in so many ways he is, but we'll reserve that word for a careful scientific kind of way, but explorers and documenters of extended consciousness, which is really where, where all the action is. Jürgen, sorry for going on and on. Thank you so much for coming on and joining me. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to see you again, Alex. It's good to talk to you. So folks who are jumping into this, take a big step back for the uninitiated. Can you tell folks a little bit about, oh, you know, because like there's so much to you, man. I left out an amazing artist, just an amazing artist, commercial artist, but now moved into doing other just fantastic works that anyone would look at and say, wow, that's that's really great stuff. So please fill in the bio, the bio there. You're going to tell people what you're about, how this came to be, and what is going on in your collective body work. Yeah, I've got, <clears throat> it started off uh, really when I was in my early 20s when I went to art school in Hamburg. And <clears throat> I experimented, that was in the early 70s, late 60s, as you do when you're an art student, you experiment with all kinds of substances. One of them was LSD. At that time, it was uh, still legal, so there was no fear attached to it. But the thing was... Other than the normal fear that... <laughs> so, yeah, that's the normal fear that comes with the experience. But that was really an, an event which uh, catapulted me after about a year or so, <clears throat> into a deep state of depression. So in order to get out of it, I somebody suggested to take up meditation. So I enrolled on a course of TM. And of course, the, the depression went almost magically after about three months. And then I became very curiously interested in, in the phenomena of meditation. And I started reading up all the books that were written about it. And so I started embarking on this, which was a very fashionable uh, pursuit in those days. It was a, it was a hippie movement going to India. <clears throat> and I embarked on this uh, adventure of meditation. And then uh, I really wanted to know you know, the essence of it. So I even, you know, meditated for about sort of five, six hours a day at one stage and nothing really happened except I got into some quite dark areas to the point that I started painting very dark pictures. So what happened? I tapped into my unconscious and out came these demonic creatures. I was at that time a painting taught by a Vienna surrealist and so that went on really well but then one night I I had a sort of quite a extreme experience like a poltergeist thing I had this picture of a demon on my easel and it fell off and not only that but an ashtray which was next to it was catapulted across the room and at that time I just didn't believe in anything supernatural and anything like that. It was totally out of my realm. But um, I was totally fearful, you know. And uh, so I, I thought I give this whole thing up. It's not getting me anywhere and it's negative and I don't like it. So I, I just returned to normal life. But then six months later or so, a fair, fair time later, I had a spontaneous peak experience. And that was when I was having breakfast, eating a sandwich. I lost my connection with my hands and my breakfast. And before long, I was in a completely different state of consciousness. Uh, I wrote about in my first book, and I've reported about it, but this totally changed my life. Not only did I experience for the first time in my life that I wasn't the body, but I also noticed that uh, there's no such thing as me as I understood myself. 
for about three weeks, I was walking around in a space which was myself. And then gradually I, I returned, but my life wasn't the same. On top of that, something was triggered. I had, uh, a few months later, I started having lucid dreams and then I had full-blown out-of-body experiences. Again, if anybody would have talked to me about it before, I would have just told them they are sort of superstitious or lunatics. So I didn't know what had happened. And then I, I uh, started investigating into it and I found out, yes, there is such a phenoma, phenomena of out-of-body experiences. And so it started from there. I then became curious and followed it up. And what followed after that was uh, some 40, nearly 50 years of inner experiences, which unfolded uh, as I kept meditating, as I got deeper into it. And uh, it's still unfolding. I mean, when I wrote my book, uh, The Ten Minute Moment in 2013, that for me was another breakthrough experience because at that time, I was in a monastery, in, in, in a sort of solitary retreat in the Scottish mountains. I was experiencing what I can only describe as a unity consciousness. And after that, I couldn't go back to my old sort of narrow self again. It was almost, the way I describe it, it was as if a, my cage made out of frosted glass had fallen to pieces and I couldn't put it back together again to see the things the way they were. So after that, um, I wrote my book, uh, Multidimensional Man, which was basically chronicling all my out-of-body experiences I had right from the beginning. And I just wanted to keep a record of it and make sense. And then um, the book came out purely by chance because my daughter, found the manuscripts, my, my diaries, and she became curious. She wanted to read them. And I said, uh, and she said, well, I can't read your writing. Can you type it all out for me? And I was curious because I hadn't looked at them for a long time. So I started typing them out. And, and sure enough, out of it came a book. <laughs> and that was the beginning. And then in 2013, I, I wrote 10 Minute Moment. And in 2015, I wrote the second out-of-body book, uh, Vistas of Infinity. Now that followed on from 2008 to 2015, seven years of very, very intense experiences. Altogether, I was about, if I add up all the time and the hours, I spent <clears throat> 60 hours <clears throat> in alternative realities, 60 hours, which is longer than most people would spend when they have a near-death experience or so. So I had plenty of opportunity to actually do in-depth investigation and research. And that was all combined in this, uh, you know, this of infinity. There are so many interesting parts of that story, just have a million questions right there. But I, let me start with a couple of those. One, as we were chatting about just a second before I hit the record button, I think the kind of intersection of you as a visual artist and then as an experiencer of this extended out-of-body realm kind of thing is, is super interesting. You mentioned as we began to roll tape that you're really interested in virtual reality right now and you kind of have the green screen image, but you're kind of immersing yourself in different uh, technological realities, which is something we'll leave that to maybe the end to talk about. But I'm interested in the, what you understand to be, to me, kind of a strange intersection between visual artist and the way that you chronicled this, like an accountant or like a, you know, like a bookkeeper to go in and make these intensely detailed records. And anyone who's tried to keep even a dream journal, you know, knows that that's a hard process to stay on top of. And you did this for years and years. Have you given any thought to kind of what drove you and, and how that relates to this kind of 
visual artist sensibility that you have? Is there, is there anything there that's interesting to you? Yeah, the thing is, of course, I've been all, always very highly visual, you know, person. I mean, um, I see when I connect to events or, you know, thoughts, you know, I see them in a highly visual way. I mean, um, right from when I was a, a child, you know, and when I started learning to read and write, uh, I started writing little stories about the things I actually experienced inside, inside myself. And, um, and I, I remember traveling through space, you know, uh, and visiting other planets. And of course, the, the visual stimulus was absolutely overwhelming. And I was sort of fortunate enough that I, I could draw, you know. So initially, um, when I first started trying to document these experiences visually, I couldn't really think of how you can possibly represent this. So I thought watercolor is probably the best medium because watercolor is, uh, is a, uh, has a luminosity which, with which you can easily represent the atmosphere, like, like the lights, you know. So I was drawn to watercolor and for a long period I, I tried to uh, paint in watercolor, but they were mostly abstract because there was no way I could reproduce the, the visual uh, abundance which I experienced just with a few brush strokes. But out of the watercolor, you emerged a few th shapes and things. So I, I focused in on these. And then I started doing um, improvisational paintings, basically being in the moment and doing abstract work. And occasionally, out of the abstract uh, paintings I did, um, visions emerged triggered by the color and the energy, you know, and, and I suddenly was drawn into a completely different state of consciousness, which was um, aided by the fact that uh, the improvisational paintings happened totally in the here and now. So there was no, no agenda, no plan of doing that. And this here and now uh, gateway opened me up to enter into completely different kinds of realities. And then one painting in particular in 1980, when I got up in the morning to meditate, I looked at a painting I did the previous, previous day, which was completely abstract, but suddenly my vision was drawn behind the brush strokes. And I closed my eyes and I had probably one of the most intensive out of body experiences, which probably lasted a couple of hours. But before then, years before then, I met an inner master, a Chinese guy who sort of, who taught me basically, you know, guided me. And you have to bear in mind, I never had a teacher, uh, you know, as in meditation. I never sort of went down this route, but I had this Chinese, master who sort of gave me these incredible um, riddles to solve and and at one stage he would communicate with me via symbols and he would give me these symbols and the symbols had the effect of raising my awareness and taking me into a different state of consciousness it's very difficult to describe, but I sometimes think of crop circles. You know, what do they mean? You know, I think there's something from a higher dimensional level which cannot be communicated in, in human language, in words. And the effect of these symbols was that they made a direct link to a state of consciousness which went beyond the human mind. This is how I, I saw it. And then, and then after, when I looked at this painting I was doing, I closed my eyes, I meditated, I had the most tremendous out-of-body experience. And in this out-of-body experience, I went through all the different levels of consciousness, through the astral level, the lower, the lower mind, right through the higher mind. I saw things which 
absolutely I've never experienced and never seen before. I could, I could see thoughts, had shapes, had form, had sound, had animation, abstract thoughts. They're no longer abstract. They were incredible, um, fascinating shapes, which are difficult to describe. But the moment I looked at these thoughts, I could understand a whole philosophy which was behind this, these thoughts, which would have taken days to un unravel. So these, so the symbols which this Chinese master sent me was a gateway into this super dimensional level, which allowed me to expand into a, a way of spirit or thinking or you no know, a, a state of mind, which went totally beyond our human limited way of reasoning. And this this was um, this was an absolute revelation. I wrote about it in, in Multidimensional Man, but this was not the end. Then my master sort of came to me again, and then he took me beyond this dimension of of the mind. Into, Sorry, Jürgen, when you say your master came to you in this uh, extended realm, master yeah. or yes, yes, he he was. The, the the thing was, he was only a presence. He didn't have a physical, but I could hear him. I could uh, be communicated by our thoughts. He had a presence and he also communi communicated this sort of sense of humor as we were uh, exploring. And then he, then I went into this state of, uh, I, I suppose, samadhi, you know. I suddenly found, I found myself in a, the way I, I described it was, I stood at the shore of an ocean. And the waves crashing in towards me were made out of light. And each light, each wave that came to me was a, was a revelation, was offering a higher state of consciousness. And when I thought, oh, and, and all the time this was happening, I was in a state of total ecstasy. And every time a new wave came crashing in on me, there was another revelation, not just a revelation, but an even higher state of consciousness. And this went on and on. And, and uh, the ecstasy in itself was, was not just a feeling. The ecstasy in itself was a revelation of a different kind. You know, so... So this is so difficult to describe because it's not something that can be easily processed through the mind because it's totally beyond, um, you know, what, what one can normally sort of make sense of. But the thing was, I came out of this and I think I only had about three experiences like this in my whole life, which were of the same sort of intensity. The first one I mentioned earlier, um, you know, after having my sandwich. The second one in 2018, and the third one in, in Scotland when I was on the retreat. And each time these happen, um, you know, you, you get to a new state. In the, or, or, of course, along the way, there are different, different um, things that happened, you know, little um, jumps along the way where you're sort of opening yourself up to other insights, you know. And I think my, my focus on my inner life, my artistic focus, going back to what you just said, is very much to do with going beyond traditional reasoning, thinking, it's, it's just going beyond that, where language is no longer the appropriate means of embracing the experience, you know. And I think that's where the two things joined. Oh, that's, that's really, really fascinating on so many levels. You know, the, the 
one question I guess I or area I wanted to dig into a little bit is this idea of mapping, which you've really tried to do. So like mapping these extended realms. And the, the way you do that is really important because we need that. And then the second is the meaning part. And I, it seems to me like you're careful about separating those two to a certain extent, as opposed to people who jump into the meaning part. You know, like a lot of my investigation up to this point has been in the near-death experience. And one of the reasons I like the near-death experience is we can ground ourselves in some science there. In some respects, we have to say it's very faulty science because it's a science based on the idea that consciousness doesn't even exist. But even in falsifying that premise, falsifying that paradigm is a huge step forward. So what the near-death experience does is it follows it from a just boots up or bottom up way of saying, okay, what is what were the vitals of that person when, before they had their cardiac arrest? How did we measure it afterwards? And then what were they able to retrieve and chronicle, da, da, da. I like the science of that. And I would even suggest that in the last 10 years, almost more than anything I can think of, that science has changed the dialogue in some fundamental ways that we don't even realize around consciousness. The, yes. the materialistic consciousness is an illusion stuff. It just doesn't hold up. And even the people who are spinning it out there, you can see they're kind of like, no, that it isn't going to work. And I kind of think, I shouldn't say I think, I'm wondering and I'm hopeful that we can make just that similar kind of step with these extended consciousness realms. And I think you have such a key role to play in that. So it's not a matter of, I want to immediately, as everybody does, ask you what it mean. What did that demon mean? And why did it fly off the thing? And is that real? Are we co-creators of reality? What about tulpas and all the rest of that kind of stuff? But I want to take a step back and say, how would we begin to, in the best way possible, just start mapping these realms in a way that might be understandable and useful to us? Does, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by science. You know, I'm a real bit of a science addict. And right from the beginning, I thought the best way to deal with these experiences is to be as factual as I possibly can and just record it. And ever since I saw myself as a reporter rather than a theor theoretician or somebody who can make sense of it, because uh, there are a lot more people better qualified to, to evaluate or the data. I see what I'm producing is basically data, reports, you know, and, and there were some people who have taken it as such and there were scientists and looking at it from purely from the evidential or the, the reporting aspect of it. I, I try to, um, in my books, I try to find uh, some sense or come to some explanation in it, but it never really quite worked because uh, I'm an artist, you know. I did, um, I did meet Tom Campbell. Um, he has built his own uh, model of reality. He's much better equipped to do that. But when I look at all these models, in the end, it comes always back to, we just want to have a narrative. We want to make sense of it. Okay, and we, we want the explanation. We have always done that. We went like the Greeks, they invented their gods to make sense of reality. And, and we just still want to do that. But the difficulty is the moment we dress it into, into this duality of words, we inevitably leave an aspect out which is beyond it and which cannot be easily explained. And the moment we do that, we start limiting these. And, and I found reality is a very dynamic process. The moment 
the moment you try to catch it, it's like herding cats, you know. The moment you, you think, ah, I've got it all under control now, that is how it is. A religion is born, <laughs> you know. And, and so so uh, one, one possible explanation for that in very simple terms is that we are in the wrong dimension <laughs> to, to do that. I just, so let me hit you with just, you know, we're, I, I kind of set up that I wasn't going to do this, but I am going to do this, kind of just ask you the question and then based on your experience, what do you think? Do you think this is, because this is like so commonly expressed, right? The near, what, what you just said. So take your experience, which is an out-of-body experience, which is different than a near-death experience. We don't know in what way it's different, but we accept going in that it's different because you weren't dead at the very least from a physiological standpoint. And then we start seeing these similarities, like what you'll hear over and over again is a near-death experience will come back. And these are people who are truly dead. I always mention this because people get hung up on this and they go, you don't realize they weren't really dead. It's like, really? Go talk to Dr. Sam Parnia, the leading resuscitation expert in the world and also a near-death experiencer. And he'll tell you, no, these people were more dead than most accounts we have because we had them in a hospital and we know their, the physical uh, condition they were in. But I digress only slightly. People come back from their near-death experience and they say essentially what you just said, Jurgen. They say, I knew everything. No sooner would a question enter my mind that I knew it and I knew it more completely than I could have even asked it. But yeah. don't ask me to express it now because from this realm, this dimension, I can't. And mm -hmm. is that a hint that, you know, we're always going to be kind of handicapped maybe severely in trying to explore that from this dimension? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I think that's a, that's a really big problem. That's why I'm very keen um, to use technology really to, to create, a, a, to find a stimulus for people to have their own experience really. The thing is, for example, you need to have the experience because um, even skeptics who had a near-death experience, you know, they would never have believed it before what they experienced. And, and there are a number of near-death experiences who were skeptics and they were then changed people. And a lot of the things which I have experienced are very similar to near-death experiences. But I think because I've been able to, um, to focus on different strata of consciousness, deliberately rather than being catapulted into an out-of-body state like a near-death experience, I was able to focus my awareness quite deliberately, knowing exactly what has happened to me. I could go into higher states of consciousness and I could go down into the lowest state of consciousness and, and map everything out without being fearful whether I have died or not, you know. And so there's a big difference in that. But, uh, but there are a lot of similar similarities, you know. So, so um, yeah, I mean, from a, from a science point of view, it's so difficult. So what I was thinking now, I, I was hoping I can use virtual reality to create... Um, a, a tool which may allow people to trigger um, an altered state of consciousness, you know. And, and I was encouraged when I first came across virtual reality in 2014, I created a, a, a kind of tunnel experience, which is very often reported. And I tried to combine the tunnel experience with the sounds which were also going into a certain place within the body which you know have certain uh, creates a certain stimulus and then being so surrounded in this virtual experience rather than seeing it on a flat screen or, or just listening to it this uh, extensive um, bombardment of stimuli 
uh, hopefully creates a, a trigger to an inner sympathetic uh, reality. Now, the interesting thing was, after I relay, released the first uh, app of this tunnel experience, I was on a developer's um, group where all the techies hung out to work with virtual reality. There were no, nobody was interested in any spiritual experiences or anything. So I released this in the tech group and soon enough, I think there were about 3000 downloads in the end. And I had some interesting comments. Some people said it felt like a near death experience, although they, they felt that is how it must feel if you die, you know. People said, oh, I lost total sense of time. You know, because the experience is such, it takes you out of the linear time stream. You, you have no bearings. You don't know what's beyond it. You're just in a tunnel, literally in a tunnel vision. And, and so I've taken this on. And, and this morning I completed the second experience, which of course is based, based on everything I've done before. And I played it to my daughter, who is a yoga teacher, okay? <laughs> I wanted to have a first sort of impression. And she actually reported there were certain things happening inside her body, especially in the heart chakra. She knows all about these different energy centers. And, and she said she felt a very powerful connection, which, she, which was like a forgotten memory, you know? She didn't even know she had. And she connected to an archetype. <clears throat> and I think that is really important. If we can create tools which uh, allow us to create a connection to our archetypes and the archetypes become activated and take over, then we have an experience. And, and if we can make this experience, um, you know, <clears throat> independent of, let's say, drugs or any, any other sort of methods, then we can possibly give a large, en large enough number of people the tools to report on these experiences they have and find a consensus where scientists can say, oh, statistically, 75% have reported such and such by using this tool which opened their consciousness. And, and amongst these people, so and so many people experience the light phenomena and other things. So we have got a much broader base to create a science, base a science on which is based on statistics. And these statistics is like a lot of people reporting the same phenomena in nature when enough people report the same phenomena, then science will accept it as a given, you know, and, yeah, and they rule out illusion, delusions and things like that. Yeah, that's, so, that's terrific. And, and what, a, what an interesting place to uh, imagine that we might get. Yeah. Very encouraging. Let, let me take this in a kind of another direction. And I kind of tipped my hand at the beginning of where I'm going. And as I've gone down this thing of why evil matters, which is my book, no one quite gets it. They're always kind of, they want, they get stuck on evil. And that's like, it's not, I'm not talking about evil. I don't care about evil. I'm all about the opposite of evil, whatever that is, without, to, without having to define it. But what I think it does is it is a lens, another lens into this extended realm, that if we are going to do the kind of mapping that you're talking about in the broadest sense, and I love the way you brought science into it, where, you know, I get the sense that you have gained knowledge that informs your life on a daily basis. And I can see like you're a family person and the love I can see in your face when you talk about your daughter, you know, it, that is what you're about. It, it, it just comes through. So I go to evil just because I think we have to go there. Like one of the interviews I have in, in my book is with 
uh, a woman named Annika Lucas. And I connected with Annika because she's into yoga. I'm super into yoga, like your daughter, have been for the longest time. And Annika's a very cool yoga teacher who's used it to really transform her life after some unbelievable trauma when she was a young child. And that trauma was that at six years old in Belgium, she was sold by her mother into a satanic ritual abuse cult. And this is the cult that uh, I always mention this, you know, if you're interested or want to fact check this, look in the 90s. This cult was all over the news in Belgium because it went to the highest levels of government throughout Europe and they were going to, you know, drain the swamp, get these guys and all the rest of it. And what they were doing to, for, for purposes of our discussion, they were doing the worst of the worst. But what they were doing was trying to mess with these kids' consciousness, trying to destroy their consciousness in a way that I later learned the reason why they do try and promote disassociative identity disorder and why they did it in the MK Ultra program. And I talked to a clinical psychologist named Dr. Tom, named Dr. Tom Zinzer, who's worked with uh, patients for a long time, and he's found a similar result in his communications with the extended realm. And here's what's very dark, but needs to be put on the table, is these folks are trying to connect with extended realms. We can only assume from what you're saying that these are very dark, low realms, uh, but that is part of this game, apparently. This is part of this terrain. And I just, I want to know if you have any insights into that part of it, I don't want to stare into the abyss. I don't want to dwell on it or talk about these horrific crimes, which we all know exist. I want to try and understand it from an extended consciousness realm that you've explored. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I have had my own sort of encounters with, uh, with what can only be described as real evil, you know. Uh, during these out-of-body experiences. But um, I always found it is identification gone wrong. People who identify, first of all, there's no way that you can go into a higher dimensional levels if you are holding on to an identification, you know, or to a kind of selfishness or self-interest you know because that just doesn't work because it's like uh, going into a hot air balloon uh, which is still tied to the ground you just cannot get out of this level of consciousness my my uh, encounter with evil came when i you know, after these atrocities happened, 9-11 uh, and the suicide bombing, I was dead, dead keen to find out how do these people believe they can go into paradise when they commit these unspeakable crimes. And And so one day I was taken, I was in an out-of-body experience, and and I was taken into a very dark realm, and it looked like a sort of Victorian industrial wasteland. It was very dark. The 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 ground was covered in soot and debris, and uh, the horizon, the, the the sky was black with red flashes of lighting, big smoke billowing. It was like a picture out of Dante's Inferno, the proverbial negative picture of hell and i thought god where where have i been landed here now you have to bear in mind that i'm always in in this here now consciousness okay i'm not identified in the sense so so i still have the objective aspect viewing these things and i have encountered some very dark things without losing a an ounce of my integrity or my connection to to my higher self, you know. But then I was led into this pit where um, 
there were piles of human bodies. And out of these piles, there was a guy which I instantly identified as a suicide bomber, who was trying to disentangle himself from these materialized thought forms of his victims. And whenever he tried to pray to Allah to relieve him of this pain he was in, and it was, it was a real physical pain and a mental pain, he, he was confronted with the reality of his situation, that he cannot undo what he has done. So his, he was in a feedback loop, okay? And this was a, a situation he couldn't get out of. And then I saw there were other places like that. And then uh, this guy came to me, a Muslim guy with a turban, um, and he was quite dirty from all the soot. And he said, please, please help these people. You know, he was trying to help them. But he was, as he was trying to help them, he was attacked by other people who were ro roaming around in this area. And, um, and I think what, what is happening inevitably with evil is an absence of awareness. And because of this absence of awareness, uh, the focus is on things they can identify with and make sense of. So they're continuously looking for some form of gratification which enhances their uh, identification with which was whatever they have grown fond of so they're forever uh, trapped in this realm of identification and also um, there's no end to it when you think you've reached the end there's always another level where you can go even a little bit deeper you know a little bit darker and it's almost as if it's part of our of consciousness itself, part of consciousness, wanting to explore, wanting to find out, you know, and at any cost almost. And I think the problem is <clears throat> that people, instead of finding out the, the string that connects them to their core consciousness, to their core identity, they are entangled with strings of identity focused on other things which provide temporary gratification, you know. Can I bounce something off you? Uh, this yeah. is kind of another model, but what you were just saying there in the strings thing kind of ties this. Let me just bounce it off you, see what you think. We are beings of light, beings of connection with this infinite, divine intelligence. Forgive me if those words kind of trigger people one way or another. Let's just say that's the model. And what we're really identifying with when we think of evil and when we think of addictive behavior or when we think of really unhealthy behavior is a blockage of that energy. And sometimes when that energy becomes blocked, we just need, we, we so intensely want to get it out that we will take any path of getting it out. And sometimes we connect that with energy from other places that are malevolent and dark and are stuck in that same pattern and actually identify with that pattern of blockage that we have. And this is not my model or my personal experience. I'm trying to, I guess, recap and condense what I've heard from a couple of different people. But in particular, what I heard from Dr. Tom Zinzer, who is this clinical psychologist, which for 15 years, we worked with people in deep, deep hypnotherapy under a, a psychologically rig rigorous clinical model, but he'll be the first one to tell you he went completely off reservation in that he w had the assistance of a spirit guide who was instructing him in how to help these people. And the diagnosis was that kind of like you were talking about in the sandbags on the air balloon, the ego states that they had created sometimes very innocently as a child, you know, afraid, and then, you know, develop that little 
kind of wrinkle in the consciousness that kind of becomes a little bit of this traumatized individual. And then in sometimes for some people, it's a lot worse, or it's just a mild, I need to be of the protector, I need, you know, all these different shadows to put it in kind of Jungian terms, you know, all these different ego states that we create that we haven't fully resolved, become blockages of energy. And but here's the key thing that he said that I guess I want to get your opinion on just straight away. He suggested a certain science to that in that those ego states, if they become developed and if they are connected to a negative energy field, can actually be entry points for entities that are stuck on these lower levels that want to connect with this level. And that can create a lot of, you know, pretty unhealthy, bad stuff for people. And we could go in and chronicle that. And here I'm not talking about the worst of the worst. I'm just talking about this as being widely, widely reported. And I think misunderstood in terms of the role that might these other entities that we don't fully even understand might be playing. Does it, does any of that, uh, does that fit at all with what you, your understanding yes. of things? Yes, very much so. I mean, um, what I found out is that the, these uh, negative entities, of which there are many, if you get to a certain level, a dimensional level, you know, um, they, they can only connect to you if you have a similar spot inside you, you know, they can anchor into. If you don't have the, any of these spots, they're totally uh, helpless. For example, when I went into this uh, darker realm where suicide bombers were, there were also uh, some, some um, ISIS fighters, people with machine guns and things, you know, running around looking for enemies, finding them in, in, in the form of their thought forms, you know, uh, and they were, looked very real to them. And then they they tried to attack me and shoot me with their machine guns. But as soon as they trained the machine gun on me, the bullet sort of plopped out of the nozzle and fell to the ground. There was nothing they could hang on to. And, and, and that is the thing. So they continuously looking for, um, for a victim who has got these sort of dark aspects within them or compatriots you know they can they can identify as an enemy so they they're keeping themselves to themselves very much and um, I had some interesting experiences for um, there was a woman which I reported in my book she died of a heroin overdose <clears throat> and before she died she had a very, very negative life. She was in a dependency situation. She was uh, really badly treated and she was in a very dark place. And when I saw her, she looked like a zombie. You know, she was diseased on this low astral level, it was very dark. And she, um, I could immediately see where she came from because when I'm in this state, I have um, I've got access to to the people, you know, to the knowledge what is sort of combined. This is I, I immediately get a sort of um, information download what had happened to her. Anyway, I then um, I felt really sorry for her, so I I went up to her and I I asked her whether she knew that she was dead, and she thought she was just in a bad dream, you know. And I said, no, sorry, you, you're dead, you know. And, and she started crying and she, um, she was in a terrible state. So I put my arm around her and I started talking to her. And we gradually walked, kept walking. And as, we, as I was talking, her skin sort of cleared up. She became better. The, the atmosphere became lighter. It was like morning. Uh, and then we ended up in a park with green grass and trees and she was completely 
restored to her normal self by the time we arrived there. So, so the, once this sort of identification is broken, we can get, we can step out of this uh, role playing we have adopted or this, this habit we have entered into, you know, or we have been conditioned into. And when that happens, of course, it becomes very quickly, very clear that we are in a much better, more powerful state, you know. And uh, inevitably, the people I met on the lower levels, they were in a very narrow, uh, narrow bandwidth of, of their mind. And they, felt, they may have felt very powerful because they had a lot of people under their control of that realm. But they were in a very narrow bandwidth of uh, freedom. You know, they were very limited. And, and the moment this is pierced, the, the moment they show a, a sign of a need of wanting to break out, that can be used as an anchor for anybody who is sort of coming along and, and gradually string them out of it. And I, I gave an example in, in my book, Business of Infinity, of one of these rescue missions, you know. So I don't know whether that answers any, any of your points you, you just made earlier. It does. It was incredibly powerful. Hey, a couple of big picture questions. I think we can assume the answer here, but I don't want to assume. I want to hear your take. Hierarchy of consciousness. Again, you know, it's just <clears throat> baffling to me that we live in this super scientific age where biological robot meaningless universe meme still <laughs> carries the day if you're in academia. They de completely deny it. But let's get past that because we are past that. And then let's even embrace the idea as we have in this interview that there are these extended consciousness realms. If we draw a big circle around all that, does there seem to be a hierarchy to it? And the trigger word that we don't want to say is God, but because if there is a hierarchy, that kind of suggests that. Or is it just kind of this blob of consciousness that doesn't really have, we couldn't really attach any kind of hierarchy, hierarchical kind of structure to it? Yeah. I have to say, I never really found a word for for my experiences of higher consciousness. You know, even when, when I was sort of faced, this is incredible light, as I stood on the ocean, the thought never occurred to me to use the word God. I had, I had an experience when I wrote uh, The Ten Minute Moment, where I meditated and I suddenly was gripped by an intense fear, you know, and the fear was that I was being dissolved and not only lose my ego, but lose everything, my, my existence. And I, th I felt if I go one step further, there will be God, you know, and, and, and whatever this is it will just obliterate me so this fear started developing within me and and that was the only time i felt oh uh yeah there must be god okay but the funny thing was um i spent the rest of the day hunting for my ego trying to find some form of identity i could feel comfortable with you know, I didn't want to go anywhere near and I felt, I spent all my life looking for this big thing and looking for God. And now <laughs> he, he is sort of waiting in the wing and I get scared and run a mile. The interesting thing was, of course, it was all in my mind, you know. And the thing was, the next day, um, I went to sleep. I finally calmed down. I went to sleep. I had some illuminating dreams. And the next morning I woke up and I was, I had this sort of 10 minute moment experience, you know. Again, there was no, there was no way I could find a word for it. But the, the, the idea of the hierarchy has always 
the feeling of a hierarchy has always evaded me because there's only being and that's all i can come up with it's just pure and simple being there's an itness and i can't find a name for it other than the uh, the reality that i am and and it's everywhere i can look at this glass of water and it's just confirmation that it is and that's is ever how how far i ever got to that um Hey, that's, that's, that's awesome. I don't, and I don't want to pull you into saying stuff beyond that. I will share with you a story that from a recent interview I had that gets at this same thing a different way. And I was entering this really wonderful guy, English guy, David Ditchfield, and he had this incredible, he's also an artist, which is part of his story. He has this incredible near-death experience where he's pulled under a commuter train. He's going to kiss his girlfriend and the door closes on his jacket like everyone's worst fear. And he's dragged under this train and he dies and he has this incredible experience. Since then, no artistic talent before that. Now he draws these huge, huge, large scale paintings. But that's kind of a side story because David comes back and he understands his experience as being a very Christian experience mm -hmm. in seeing Jesus and seeing Jesus creating universes and stuff like that. And I said, David, I'm totally fine that you had an experience with Christ consciousness. He goes, no, no, don't say Christ consciousness. It was Jesus, you know, like son of God kind of thing. And I said, David, here's what I've learned studying near-death experiences is that one, when people study them across culture, across time, a lot of these religious figures go away. But more significantly from a meaning standpoint, David, when I talk to people that have had multiple near-death experiences, they often tell me that the, in the first experience, they do experience Jesus and they experience all that wonderfulness of Christ consciousness. But in subsequent experiences, it goes deeper. It doesn't it doesn't contradict their initial experience, but they get the sense that there is more beyond that, that there's deeper and higher forms of experience. Again, to me, that's a language, that's a hierarchical language. And David's response was to go, absolutely. I do feel that that is true. So it, there's a slight contradiction in how he's thinking about it, but who am I to pick apart, you know, what, what his experience is? yeah it's a really interesting story i i can sympathize with that because um a friend of mine and i we went in 2017 to greece we wanted to go on a kind of pilgrimage you know to uh, revisit the ancient sites the delphi oracle and and we ended up in mount athos and and that is a story i could write a whole book about because i'm not a christian my father was an atheist my mother was a christian but i wasn't brought up as a christian in a kind of belief bubble so so we went into this monastery um we didn't have any bookings and it was a bit of an adventure how where we ended up but i made friends with a monk um and we had the most fascinating conversation and during the conversation he said to to me why don't you come to one of these chapels normally people are not allowed into it it's only for ordained monks but i think i'm making an exception because we had such an interesting conversation and um, and i made quite clear to him that i'm not a christian that I've never been sort of taken to it. The only thing I like uh, is the early Christian art. He said, come with me, I show you some of these icons. <laughs> so he took me into this chapel, and this is absolutely true. He took me into this chapel um, and it was quite dark. And he seated me in front of an icon. I couldn't see it because it was too dark. He lit a, a candelabra he lowered it down in front of this icon and it was a, the Virgin Mary with a, with a Jesus child. 
And before I knew, I was overcome this total emotion and I had a breakdown. And I suddenly had this, I had an ec ecstatic experience. I felt an overwhelming love. And, and that you could have hit me, you know, with, with a feather. I, I just couldn't, there was no exp rational explanation to it. And I started crying. I, I was so overcome, I started crying. And then my friend, he went out and, and the monk went out to leave me, <laughs> leave me on my own. And then he came back in and, uh, and he said, you're okay, aren't you? I said, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, and I sort of didn't speak about it. And then, <laughs> and then to make matters worse, <laughs> he said, well, it's quite interesting. I want to show you another icon. <laughs> 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 and then he led me into this other chapel, which had an icon of the um, of a saint, um, Anastasia. She she was tortured to death in the third century, and the picture and the same thing happened. The same thing happened again. I was overwhelmed by this incredible love. But the. The other thing that happened was I went back the next day. Uh, the, the monk wasn't there. The other monks totally forbid me to go anywhere near the chapel. I was not allowed in there. I said, I've got to go back in. I want to find out more about it. So then I saw a monk up on a balcony. He killed himself laughing because I was trying to explain, you know, to him what I wanted. So he, he then relented. He allowed me back in and I meditated in front of the same uh, icon and suddenly there was this woman standing right next to me. I couldn't see her physic, uh, you know, with my eyes, but I felt her presence. And she said very clearly, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Okay. And if that is the case, then people who have an out of body experience, I'm sure if they meet Jesus, they absolutely meet Jesus because there's no such thing as death, okay? Now, the interesting thing was um, this woman, for six months, I only had to think of her. She was right beside me and we had an exchange and it was literally, death is just a massive illusion, okay? We are, not, we are not able to go beyond our physical senses. Once you uh, bridge the gap and you become uh, familiar with the expanded reality, then there is no mystery. It's all reality and people are only a thought away. So when people report these, I mean, if you had told me that about 10, 20 years ago, I would say yes. Uh, slightly crazy, it's all an illusion, you know, they're making it up. But I'm not so sure anymore, you know. So well, you're, you're not so sure anymore, but you're not a Christian. No. So, I mean, I think, see, I don't know why I get into this, people think I'm a Christian basher, and I'm not. I'm just always saying, I'm highly respectful of your Christ consciousness experience, and I'm not trying to limit that or pigeonhole that or say that that's somehow lesser. I'm just saying, isn't that, I mean, you didn't, you didn't meet Christ in, it wouldn't make any sense to say you met Christ. So it was in this extended consciousness realm and you met Christ. I don't know exactly what that means, but I accept mm -hmm. the reality to that. What I don't understand and what just seems uh, like ridiculously obvious to me in the same way it seems absurd to think that science could continue to prop up this consciousness as an illusion thing. It's just like there's something deeper going on there. That's more than just a meme. That is a, a conscious effort on some people to systematically control people because that's a better way to yeah. keep people afraid and scared and buying shit and not, you know, thinking too deeply about stuff. You know, you know that's, that's my take on it. Where I wanted to really tie this back to was religion because where I'm thinking lately is that religion is similarly absurd 
in the sense that if we come to the understanding like we're talking about here, that there is this extended realm and you're, by all accounts, the highest purpose of your life is to connect with this super light love energy in whatever form. And you're do there doing a VR to try and help people do it. And your daughter's doing yoga classes, trying to help her doing it. And these monks are trying to help people do it. But religion is kind of doing a little trick there. They're saying, hey, we can help you do that. But by the way, we are going to limit how you, how, we will be. I mean, this is always the case with religion. This is the cult part of it. We will be the sole keepers of your access to that. And we will say how you access it and how you don't access it. And we will similarly control and manipulate you in a way that seems completely unnecessary. That's why the important part of your story is you can have that experience and accept the Christian experience and say, but that doesn't make me a Christian. No, that's the thing. I mean, the, the main issue that is always gets lost is liberation, is the freedom aspect in religion. Um, there's always this sort of tendency of wanting to own people, you know, wanting to own something. The ego. Therefore, yeah, wanting to limit, limit it. But at the end, the end result is liberation from all concepts, from all um, demarcations, is total liberation. If that aspect is missing, then I'm afraid we are sort of uh, not seeing the bigger picture, not fulfilling our whole potential. To me, that has always been the number one thing, is the freedom it grants us a freedom to um, go beyond our limitations, go beyond our identifications, and be able to dynamically experience a new world every moment, every day, okay, without, without any boundaries, without saying, oh, this is how it is, you know, this is uh, what it is all about, no. We're just sort of discovering it again and again new because we are now part of it, that thing we are discovering. And in discovering it, we are discovering ourselves, which is it. Okay. And there, when, there lies the incredible liberation. And also there lies the ecstasy it brings. There's ecstasy to be found in living every moment because we are not tied up, we are not tied to one single thing, to, to one belief, to one theory, to one model. We, we transcend that and we are opening ourselves up to be explorers, not knowing what is to come next. And it's beautiful because we already know we are it, and we cannot get lost. Whatever we explore and discover is another level of our ecstasy, of our ecstatic living. And, and any beliefs which don't allow us this exploration of freedom, uh, they're just limiting us. And that's why I'm not anti-religious because um, they they <clears throat> they do explore, give people um, stepping stones, you know. But when you come to the last stepping stone, or they let's say they they create a scaffolding, you know, which we. But once we build the sculpture, we don't need the scaffolding, you know. We we are we are it, you know. That's a, that's the thing with religions. That's why I find. I find them always limiting, but uh, but religious people don't like to talk about freedom. You know, they don't like that word. <laughs> Jürgen, I think that was absolutely wonderfully beautiful, so fantastic, and I can't think of a better way to wrap up this terrific conversation you've treated me to. Can you tell folks a little bit about 
what else is going on in your world, how they might keep track of what you're doing. And, and I definitely want to point them to those YouTube videos you did that were fantastic. What else do they need to know about? about yes, I mean, I belong to a group um, of uh, afterlife researchers, which is very interesting. It's a very interesting, beautiful group because uh, they explore the whole, whole territory of the afterlife. And I've been a member and once a month, I, the people gather questions and, and I try to answer them from my sort of experience. And, and that is really interesting because um, some of these questions allow me to bring out things which are not widely known, you know, and, and therefore there's always something new coming out. The other thing is, um, yeah, I mean, because I'm main, mainly an artist and the virtual reality is what, uh, what I'm really sort of at the moment exploring. And I had a lot of help people trying to uh, make it possible for me to, to go into any depths. So hopefully um, I will be able to find some very practical and very illustrative ways of taking people into uh, realities via documentation which they can experience and and hopefully it will lead a bit further than that you know hopefully i mean the ultimate goal would be to devise a tool which hopefully will trigger lucid dreams in people that that is the goal so, so people have, can have the own, their own experience first of all by getting uh, a much closer feeling of an alternate reality by maintaining uh, wakefulness, okay, but in an alternate reality, and therefore making it easier to make the jump into the dream consciousness and then perhaps trigger a lucid dream. And that's what I'm, I'm aiming for. Well, that's just fantastic work. I mean, anyone who isn't excited about all those things, I mean, that could be truly culture changing, history changing, although we don't know what effects those kind of things have, but we have to go forth and try the best we can. Our guest again has been Jurgen Ziva. It's terrific, terrific to connect with you. Thanks again, Jurgen, so much for joining me. Thanks, Alex. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks again to Jurgen Ziva for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I have to tee up, and it's not, I guess, so much of a question really, but what do you make of Jürgen's experience of waves of love and knowledge? There's something there that I think is central to this whole thing that we're talking about. And Jürgen is such an awesome embodiment of what he's talking about, isn't he? So what do we think of that? What do you think of that? Is that too light in love for you or how do you process that let me know your thoughts i'd love for you to jump over to the skeptico forum and leave a comment there leave a note there really dig into it but if you're not so inclined find another way to uh, telepathically send me a message and tell me what you're thinking as always thanks so much for joining me on this little journey that i'm on and for sharing it with others who you think need to hear it until next time, take care and bye for now.